Welcome back once again. We are in part two of module six, security and safety computer concepts. This is our last module of this section. And as I've said previously, this is my jam. This is where we really get into the fun stuff that I'm educated on, that I'm knowledgeable on, and that I think it's most important to share with you as it pertains to your life utilizing digital technology. So in this section, we're gonna look at uh, steps to protect computer equipment, protecting mobile devices, and of course, protecting your privacy. Hugely important. So I think it goes without saying, I've told you in previous videos, when I use red text, it is something I wanna point out. It is a point that I really wanna make. And of course, you'll see a lot of red text in this video because this is important. This is your safety, this is your finances, this is your credit, and this is your life online. So I should have had a picture of Captain Obvious right here. Protect yourself while online. Make that your focus with everything you do online. As you enjoy the internet, as you enjoy the convenience, as you enjoy the connections with your peers and long lost friends from high school, for those of you that just didn't graduate high school, protect yourself online. Alter internet settings to secure against security breaches. I'm gonna show you how to do that a little bit, but this starts with some basic knowledge and basic understanding. It starts with understanding that when we talk about securing against security breaches, it starts with just creating an encrypted wireless network that you use at your home, not leaving it open to where anybody can get on because if anybody can get on your wireless network, then they are connected to the same network you are and they thus could steal data that is not encrypted. We start with sort of a physical protection element because computing devices need power and electrical surges happen. Just recently today, I heard that um, they're shutting down a bunch of power temporarily in California or something. That means when that comes back on, it may create a surge. If my computer is connected, even though it's not on folks, it's connected, it could be damaged, okay? If that power surge is high enough, if I don't have surge protection in place. So we need to protect ourselves from those power surges, from brownouts, from spikes, and from what's called power noise. And we do that through a device called a surge protector. I've given you two examples here. One that would plug directly into a wall, giving me two USB devices and six plugs, okay? Um, again, a lot of people don't think about the fact that you need a surge protector when you're plugging in your phone to charge it, okay? So keep that in mind. You know, you don't just wanna plug it directly in the wall. One spike, you lose your phone. Today, that phone can be a $1,000 device, and if you don't have insurance on it, you suddenly have a cost of $1,000 where a $29.95 surge protector could have protected you. Notice here, this is more of a desktop surge protector. If you notice, there's even a means for you to put coaxial cable in, so I could literally run the coaxial cable from my modem um, out of, you know, into here and out into the modem to protect the modem from a power surge. Should the coaxial cable somehow get charged with too much power, I can do the same thing with ethernet cable. So coming out of the modem, come into here, come out here before going um, to my computer so that if the power supply happens to get an electrical surge, I'm protected. Finally, if using a computer, uh, means not losing power when there is a power outage because those tend to last for just a few minutes. A great example would be an uninterrupted power supply. And you see two examples here. You see a little desktop one that you can put under that might charge your computer and or your phone for a few minutes all the way up to business grade where one of these might power a couple servers to keep them from going down so that we don't have to restart the servers, we don't have to restart programs, we don't have to restart services. We at least know we're protecting that server while there's that temporary power outage. When we talked about physically protecting equipment, the first thing I would recommend if you have a laptop and you're using it in an environment that is not secure, and even if it is secure, go ahead and use a cable lock. Okay, so anytime I go to a hotel, etc., cetera, um, when I'm using it, I'll use a cable lock because what I might do, what I tend to do, I'm pretty anal about this, anytime I'm not using my computer, it's in the safe 
in the hotel room. When I'm not using my computer and I leave my car, I don't leave my computer in my car. I take my backpack with my computer to wherever I'm going. I keep it with me as much as I can, okay? Why is that? I'll be honest, it's because I actually had my laptop stolen. I went to Portland, Oregon for a master's class. I stopped at a gas station. I locked all the doors. I left the sunroof open. I came back, got in the car. You know, the gas is filled up. I left the gas station. I get about five miles down the road. I'm like looking over at my passenger seat going, what's different? Something's, oh my gosh, my laptop's not there. So then I stop, I pull over, you know, I look around, did I put it underneath the seat? Am I forgetting I put it in the trunk? The trunk's a great place for it, by the way. Nope, it is indeed gone. Go back and amazingly, the security cameras at that gas station didn't happen to cover the pump location I was at. Things like turning on the Find My Device. I just, before I produced this video today, I went out, I just simply Googled because I have a Google device and I have a Google account. I said, find my phone. And it did. It shows that my Pixel 3 XL uh, is in Pioneer Hall in Bend, Oregon. Okay. And it's accurate to 60 feet. So someplace there is my phone. And in fact, it is correct. Now I realize I just gave up some privacy. You now know where my office is, <laughs> but that's okay. It's important for me to show you this. There's a button for recover. We can turn off the phone, making it useless to whoever has it. But again, let's talk about, do I go try to find the phone? No, I contact law enforcement. I let them know the general proximity of the phone and let them go get it. Um, I have been involved in incidences where uh, students in high school that I know have lost their phone. They were able to track it literally to a house and that house contained another student. We didn't go knock on the door. We called law enforcement and they did their job for us. So avoid holding, you know, keep devices secure notice here i'm in a coffee shop right and my device is here um, and i need to go to the restroom i'm going to grab my device and take it with me i'm not going to leave it out of my sight you know these are expensive devices and of course when you talk about security even though i shut the um even though i shut the lid somebody could take the hard drive out of this slave it to another computer if i haven't encrypted the hard drive i encrypt my hard drive folks but i bet you don't and literally get to all the data on my hard drive if they so choose. So pause, read the rest of this slide. It's a good idea. <laughs> now, I've already said the best way to protect yourself is to back up. Back up your computer. Back up your phone. Back up your devices. My Pixel automatically backs up to Google via, I think it's called Pixel One, um, OneDrive, not OneDrive, what is it? Google One, sorry, Google One. It's part of my storage with my Google account. You know, I can back up data there. I'm backing up my entire phone there, but I actually use a third party backup to even back it up again. So I have a backup of my backup, but here's the realization of backup. Notice backup strat, backup frequency from 2008. This is from Backblaze, which happens to be a great backup company, pretty affordable too. No, I'm not advertising. I'm telling you the products I use, all right? So this is not sponsored by Backplate, Backblaze. It's not sponsored by Acronis on the next screen, okay? <clears throat> now, computer backup frequency. Notice what we see here. We see a decrease in people from 2008 to 2019 who never backed up their computer, and that's good. But most important, what we see here is how many people back up daily, what? seven eight percent on average weekly eight percent monthly 15 uh 12 and a half to well actually that's probably closer to 17 percent yearly 20 percent you know 25 percent somewhere imagine that only 25 percent of people are backing up their computer once a year i want you to consider how much data and information you add to your computer daily and how much you will lose. Folks, backing up a computer is really easy. If you wanna know how to do it, just go out YouTube. I'll make a, you know, I'll make a promotion right now for my video. I have a video that says, 
that uses a Cronus True Image. I think it's an easy software to use. It backs up my entire computer in 10 minutes, which means if somebody stole my computer, I could restore my computer, okay, in literally seven minutes. I actually practice backing up and restoring my computer. I can back it up, but if I don't know the image is able to be restored, then I really can't trust that I'm backing up my computer. Just because it said it backed up, doesn't mean it did. So I want to make sure I back up. I also want to make sure that if I put in a new hard drive or extra storage and I'm storing stuff there that I'm backing it up as well. So pretty important to back up your computer. I still recommend utilizing cloud backup just for important files, okay? But not cloud backup for an entire computer backup. In my case, we're looking at about 670 gigabytes of data and that would take hours and hours and hours to restore my computer from the web, okay, and hope I keep a connection. Keep in mind, it's not my download speed that's important. It's the upload speed from whoever is storing my data. And if a bunch of people are restoring data at the same time I am, it may literally take days versus minutes if I'm doing a local backup. Folks, you can go to, I'm going to just pick that up and put it down. You can go to Costco and for $125 get an 8 terabyte backup drive. Back up your computer as much as you want. Don't leave the backup drive in your home, put it in your car. That's what I suggest and the reason being if if somebody breaks in and steals stuff if if um of your house or your house burns down, you still have all your data backed up. It is in another location. Once a month, I back up and take it to a secure safe deposit box, knowing that I'm only going to lose one month's worth of data if at some point my car and my house are destroyed or broken into at the same time. I already said, and I'm going to say it again, (laughs) when you back up your computer, you never pay a ransom, ever because you know you're gonna be able to restore your computer. But again, practice those restores on another computer. Make sure the data is available to restore. Even if you just simply rename a couple folders on your existing computer and restore them from the backup, you at least know that some of your data has been backed up and is restored, restorable, okay? So those companies that you can see that are paying ransom, people that are paying ransom, It's because they don't have a good backup and a good restore for all of their data that's important for them to run their business, for them to run the city you live in, for them to run the state you live in, and even for them to run the nation you live in. Okay, so options online, you know, Cloud Ward or, you know, Backblaze, um, but I highly suggest an external hard drive for the entire computer and then important files, back them up on to a backup strategy. Now folks, storing your your files in cloud storage like we've talked about, please don't think that's a backup, okay? Because if those files are connected to your computer and those companies don't have safeguards against ransomware encrypting those files, you could lose those files too. So make sure whatever you're storing up there that you're backing it up someplace else. A lot of the backup strategies now cover the ability for you to back up your cloud-based storages. You want to make sure you do that. So, you know, as we talk about protecting mobile devices and your privacy, we're talking about making sure we're on encrypted Wi-Fi connections. Today, we don't tend to plug our computers in uh, to wired networks. Unless we're at home, we're looking for better speed, the majority is going to be used Wi-Fi. We want to make sure that when we're on a Wi-Fi network, and we'll look more in detail about this, that we are using an encrypted Wi-Fi network, meaning the wireless fidelity um, communications are encrypted from my computer back to the router, back to the Wi-Fi access point, and then on to the web. If I'm accessing data, am I accessing websites that are HTTPS or SSL? Are my usernames, passwords, credit card informations being encrypted and do I know it? One of the challenges I have with doing any kind of financial information on site on my smartphone is I don't know if the website I'm buying from literally has encryption. It doesn't have the necessarily HTTPS in the corner. However, you can do some research, find out what they are using. Okay, so it is important to make sure, and you, frankly, 
are responsible for making sure that you're using encrypted connections as you're doing these financial transactions. You know, viewing or stealing computer data so attacker again can come in through a Trojan, gain access to your computer, watch what you're doing, steal data, take advantage of your um, webcam, turn it on, turn it off, all these things can be done. You know, Trojans, viruses, other malwares on computer that you don't even know exists, you should. You should get a proper virus protection, malware protection, scanners, you should know what the baseline performance of your computer as you use it is. And if you start seeing it slow down, you should go into the task manager that we've looked at before. See if there's a bunch of network traffic when you're doing nothing on the computer and network traffic spiking. It means there's probably something going on with your computer that you may not be aware of. Of course, how does this information get on our computer? We download it. We get hit by a phishing scam that says, hey, your computer's vulnerable, download this, we'll fix it for you, because we're Microsoft and we love you. Those kind of things, you know, download um, inappropriate materials. So here you see, you know, downloading child pornography to a computer. Remember we talked about hacktivists? Well, as much as there's people that, you know, will put malicious code into things that you download that you shouldn't, a lot of those people are doing it because you shouldn't be doing that and they're gonna make you pay for doing things you shouldn't be doing. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, there's many ways, you know, don't download an executable that you don't trust. Don't click on links that you don't trust. Today, in most browsers, we can mouse over the, the link and in the lower left-hand corner, it'll show the full link. So if it says I'm going to Microsoft, but then you notice it says Microsoft, you know not to go there, you know not to click, and you know to report it if you're working for a company that wants you to report these malwares because they can quickly block things so that someone else doesn't get hit by it. Back a little bit more to Wi-Fi. The reason I'm focusing on Wi-Fi so much is because you are using it a ton. You're connecting your mobile devices, your tablets, your smartphones to just any Wi-Fi so that you have internet access. <laughs> Free Wi-Fi folks, I gotta be honest, <laughs> I gotta make the suggestion, don't use it. Don't go to the coffee shop and connect to the free Wi-Fi and use it just like that. What you can do to protect yourself is implement what's called a VPN, a virtual private network. And what you see down here is, I can actually use a VPN service. There's a lot available online. Um, they give you a little client that goes on your computer. And what it means is when you connect, all of your data is being encrypted from your computer through to the VPN service. And thus, as it traverses over the web, you know it's encrypted. It's another level of encryption versus just the HTTPS that's offered through a browser. Okay. So what this does is it means when I sit down at a coffee shop and I connect to my VPN at home, I know that even if somebody's looking at data on the coffee shop, all they're going to see from my computer is encrypted data. They're not going to be able to see even plain text data that is not encrypted because in fact I am encrypting it. And then of course, I trust the internet from my VPN service out to the internet. Okay, and then of course I'm still looking for HTTPS, I'm looking for digital certificates, etc. Today when we talk about encrypting, make sure you don't leave your network open. This includes your guest network. Do not leave your guest network open with no password. Create a password for it. Have a separate network for guests that come to your house so that they don't have to be on your network where you're doing banking and private information. Okay, especially teens, hate to say it parents, but teens... Teens don't care about privacy. Teens aren't looking at this stuff like they should be. You want to protect your own stuff from your own kids. And what that means is that at my house, when my teens are connected to the internet, they're doing it through a guest network that I know has no access to my private network that I use for my files. Okay? You want to make sure to use WPA today. WPA, WPA2 is pretty much the standard. There's a brand new standard coming out called WPA3. We're going to see that with Wi-Fi version 6, okay, which means some new equipment. That's how they're going to get you to buy new equipment because they're going to sell you on security. WEP, Wireless Equivalency Protocol. 
uh, WPA Wi-Fi protected access. That's really what you want to be using. WEP is actually easily hackable. So um, it uses an, um, a cipher text, um, the RC, I want to say it's the RC4 cipher that has been hacked. So if you have old equipment, you really want to update to equipment that will support WPA so that you can be protected. So that's it for part 2A. We're going to hit part 2B next time, which is the last part of our series on module 6, security and safety. We're going to talk about using strong authentication, explain the benefits of encryption, discuss measures, because I told you use WPA encryption. I want to show you what encryption is so that you understand how it works, how your data is being protected. And then finally, we'll discuss measures to prevent identity theft and protect your financial information. Until then, take care.